increase knowledge transfer, collaboration, uh, the competitiveness of Europe, Germany had the idea during its presidency in 2007 to have an IP charter, to have this European approach. Um, this was taken up by the European Commission last year and it adopted an IP recommendation. The, the whole title, it's quite long. It's the Commission Recommendation on the Management of Intellectual Property in Knowledge Transfer Activities and Code of Practice for Universities and Other Public Research Organizations. Um, it's huge. It's specifically addressed to the public sector um, to increase knowledge transfer to encourage collaboration between the public and the private sector. But this is, of course, also a recommendation that could be addressed to SMEs who could take up how to manage their IP professionally to avoid, in the end, uh, having problems such as infringements or having to enforce their rights because they have been set up properly and have had um, the proper information beforehand because they know where to go to or how to achieve that information. Um, this commission recommendation was supported also by council, which invited the member states to take up this recommendation and um, also uh, the stakeholders to take up the code of practice, but also to apply this recommendation to different EU policies, such as the EIT, such as the framework program, or such as um, Eureka. When looking at Eureka, Germany just now is uh, in negotiations for associations of different countries just like Egypt. Um, South Korea has just been associated to Eureka. And when I was looking at the agreement that was signed between Eureka and South Korea, I was a bit surprised to see the IP sector because I was expecting like, well, two pages at least. But it consisted of one sentence saying um, appropriate IP rules will be applicable. Okay. Um, we know, and this is something that uh, Georg um, Buchtela was just now mentioning, different countries, different cultural backgrounds, different legal backgrounds, um, different understanding also of intellectual property or background or foreground. Um, when I was working for the European Commission in DGRTD, um, I knew about negotiations going on with Japan, which were taking more than six years, because the understanding of granting access to background was completely different for the Japanese than it was understood in the European sense. So these negotiations were taking a long time in order to understand really what do you really want with granting the access to background? Are you stealing our knowledge? No, we're not. We're going to set up some legal framework so that it's going to work out, and, but we need this in order to cooperate with one another. Um, we've also seen in a, in a German study that was being done by the federal ministry that there's also different understanding of legal contracts. When looking at different countries, certain countries don't find legal contracts really binding. For them, it's like a, a guideline. Um, so it's important to know when you're setting up all these uh, trade secret agreements or uh, letter of intents of mem memorandums of understanding, how binding is it for the other party? You can secure yourself, you can try, but it's better to set up a cooperation from the beginning in such a way that you won't have any problems with enforcement or infringements. Um, counterfeiting and piracy are, of course, one of the effects that you could be having, and this is also something that is a disincentive, especially for SMEs, when they are thinking of, oh my God, uh, where am I getting the support? Just like Georg said, uh, who's going to uh, support me financially? Uh, this is just an information desk when I go to the IPR help desk, but at least it exists. I'm happy there is the IPR help desk. It's set up by DG Enterprise. Uh, it's specifically for, en for SMEs in China to support on questions of intellectual property rights. Um, but I believe it's, it's not enough, and I think we need to do more in this case. And um, the CREST, that is the Committee of Research, Science, and Technology, which consists of representatives of the member states and associated countries, have set up a specific group, a working group on knowledge transfer, which consists of 33 member states and associated countries, um, that um, has to uh, help implement this recommendation of the Commission. This recommendation of the Commission addresses on one hand the member states to set up policies to encourage knowledge transfer, not only in Europe but also in an international context. And it addresses in its code of practice the stakeholders to set up not only internal guidelines for their own institution but also to set up knowledge transfer guidelines and it gives some advice on how to negotiate contracts, collaborative research, contract research. Um, these, this uh, working group on knowledge transfer 
has also set up as one of its priorities to develop international guidelines in order to support not only um, the public sector, but it's also something that could be used by the SMEs or, for example, by the Commission or member states or Eureka. So it's going to consist of two parts, one part for policy recommendations for negotiations of bilateral or multilateral agreements, and a second part addressing really how should I go forward if I'm going to have international cooperation as an SME or um, as a stakeholder. Um, we are thinking of providing support to these guidelines with specific IT tools that already exist in a European context but not in an international context uh, with an interactive toolkit. It exists um, like with a checklist of questions that you can just tick mark the questions and it will give you a reply what it would advise when you're having international cooperation, how to go on, but also to give you a background of the legal circumstances of a certain country. When, for example, having uh, negotiations with Russia, also now with the framework program, um, it has been quite difficult regarding uh, ownership of intellectual property because if there is a state interest, the Russian government has the right to retain ownership and not the institution that is cooperating with you, for example. So if you know these things beforehand, you can make sure that your agreement has some special paragraph on IP ownership. Um, so um, basically, we're also, of course, thinking of enforcement support, how to do this, and maybe some of the ideas that we're coming up with here uh, could be useful for these international guidelines as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the um, rules and guidelines for technology transfer. And maybe uh, from that we can we can uh, assume that um, the easy of the easiness of enforcing a patent is related to the the quality of the patent itself. And I think that's a good introduction to to go to um, Mr. Witten from from Qualcomm to say what, what does it make a good patent? What would it be uh, to have uh, a good patent? Okay, right. Well, well thank you, Simon. Um, uh, uh, much of my prepared uh, talk was uh, very similar to what um, Margot Frohlinger said. So I've, I've rewritten um, what I'm going to say, and uh, I'm going to start with, with just some anecdotal evidence in support of, of many of the points that Mrs. Frohlinger uh, made. Uh, my company is Qualcomm, and... Uh, um, as I'm sure some of you will know, uh, we were involved in a very high-profile patent dispute with Nokia. Um, ran from uh, about 2005 to 2008 when, when we reached an agreement and settled with them. Now, you, you may be surprised to know that, that uh, Qualcomm and, and Nokia share a, a lot of common ground, and many of the arguments that we have are on, on the details. But uh, let's not get into that. What I will say, though, is that uh, in the... Um, uh, in the spat that we had, uh, both sides spent huge amounts of money. Uh, I was looking after Europe, and I know that we spent millions of, of dollars because we're Qu uh, Qualcomm, a, a U.S. company, and uh, I, I know Nokia also spent millions of euros uh, uh, in the battle. Uh, one of the reasons for this is because we had to run the, the same actions in, in many different countries to try and get uh, uh, an effect across the whole of Europe. The, um, uh, the differences between the, the national offices actually uh, create uh, uh, opportunities. And for sophisticated companies like Qualcomm and Nokia, um, uh, we played those opportunities. We, we, we tried to get, uh, as the patent holders, we tried to get early decisions on infringement in Germany. We tried to delay the UK action because the UK courts are seen as being patent hostile and we, 